Um, so my name is Marie Mott. I am a local activist and an investigative journalist and radio broadcaster with Nuga Radio 92.7 FM. And I cover a myriad of stories that have to deal with uh, the local level here in the city of Chattanooga, whether that has been um, police brutality of which like the current story, Interstate Tax, who was beaten in handcuffs by a sheriff, I actually broke that story, which has gone viral and national. Uh, which I'm quite proud of that this young man has an opportunity to seek and obtain justice, which is not something that marginalized groups and in particular people of color often have um, in the city or even in our country. We are still trying to, uh, much like this horse, if we look at its feet, we're trying to find, <laughs> we're walking a very tight rope. Um, which has very, very little room for error when it comes to fighting for justice. It's difficult to try to um, find a placehold when we talk about um, systemic um, avenues of oppression. It's difficult, um, whether that is housing, whether that is redlining, gentrification, whether that is school, education, whether that is just criminal court, um, it is difficult. Uh, and one of the things I wonder sometimes, because Chattanooga has a very rich history, we think that it starts with Cherokee, but actually it does not. As a matter of fact, if you are familiar with the Lincoln Park era, area, um, it goes beyond Cherokee. There are Muscogee and Yuchi ties uh, to this area that predate, we're talking about hundreds of years, any Cherokee that actually would come down from Oklahoma and uh, far east coast and would come down to Tennessee and land here in the city of Chattanooga. So we talk about, um, in, and in particular, Lincoln Park, um, they are working currently, it just turned 100 years old, we have uh, a century of history of Native American and Afri African American ties and the city wants to build a road through a historical Native American and African American neighborhood. And even when we talk about um, historical neighborhoods in the city of Chattanooga, there is not one, not one of color. Um, so. This, this piece spoke to me because, number one, uh, we have the warrior. Uh, we have the warrior who is, he's tired. He's come a long way. I don't know how far he traveled, but he's traveled far. And my mother said that his shoulders are square. There's still some fight in him, but I wonder if he knows where he's going. And I wonder if he knows that justice or survival is on the other end of the road. Harriet Tubman said that when she left slavery and she went to the north, to that line of freedom, there was nobody there to grab her hand and bring her to the other side. And sometimes I wonder if he thought, that, is there anybody, if I even make it to freedom, if my people survive, is there going to be anybody there at the end of the freedom or the justice road to greet me there. He's a little hungry, <laughs> and the horse is quite hungry. We see the, the ribs. Sometimes uh, activism, it, it takes away your desire to sometimes even take care of yourself because you're so focused on trying to see justice all the way through. And even the, the poor horse, if you look at his eyes, the horse is tired. What a journey that not only is the warrior exhausted, but even the avenue of which he can get to the next place in life, is it possible that even his horse is going to make it? He has weapons, right? He has uh, a knife. He has arrows. He has um, what could be a spear. But as my sister <laughs> noted, that he's in kind of a submissive state. He's not ready for that next step. He's not ready to take down the next thing. And sometimes when you're exhausted from trying to fight the good fight, it's very, very difficult, um, especially if you do not take care of yourself. It's difficult for you to keep on fighting. If 
you've walked or even driven around the city of Chattanooga, how many of you have noticed the signs that we have going all throughout this area that say original route of the Trail of Tears? Have you all noticed them? Has anybody ever taken a moment to stop and think or picture in their mind the women, the men, the children, and what they had and what it was like to take that long walk to a reservation or a specific place or what we call um, corridor, right? When we talk about the color of law, sections of which only people of certain colors could live in areas. History is um, always told by the victors, never the losers. And so I doubt that most people sitting in this room ever even knew that, you know, our Native American history, as far as it ties to the city of Chattanooga, has goes beyond Cherokee, which is really the, the starting point of what we see from a historical context in books. But if you talk to people like um, a good friend of mine is Tom Kunish, who is a Native American who is working with Lincoln Park, who actually educated me and um, showed me that there was beyond, history beyond Cherokee, uh, Yuchi, and Muscogee. And my friend Holly, who is Muscogee, has actually done art plus issues here as well. Um, so history is told always from the victor standpoint. And that's why it's always important that we go beyond the history book. If it's possible, um, find the activists or find the historians, the people who have the actual context to what's going on. Uh, when I sit down and I talk to people about Lincoln Park, I get history from the people who are part of the story, not observers. And so you get a perspective of people who have the lived experiences of what has happened in the city and not the perspective of somebody just with a pen and a pad writing for the paper or a book um, trying to explain a historical context of what is happening uh, wherever they're talking about, like here in the city of Chattanooga. Um, many would say that an activist um, is just a person who fights for a cause, but rather I would think that activism is a ministry. Um, activism, is that is a very broad word when we think about it, right? Um, there are so many different problems that if we just look at the city of Chattanooga and go nerf, no further than that, we are plagued with a lot of issues going on in our city, right? I think it's kind of hard um, even just cracking open the Chattanooga Times and just seeing good news when we, when we read through the paper. We are kind of struggling. Uh, we're struggling in our schools. We had nine schools this year that almost got taken over by the state, and they're all concentrated in areas of immense poverty in districts such as the district that I grew up in, that I live in, that my sister lives in, where the average household is single parent led and makes less than $25,000 a year. And there was a study that came out this year that you need about $15.50 if you wanna live in the state of Tennessee. And if you wanna live in Hamilton County with one child, you need to make about $21 an hour. And then the next question you have to ask yourself, if you look at that information, who's paying that? <laughs> who real questions who who is paying that is our city keeping up with the job market are we do we have a job uh, growth and boom in the city and to keep up with the pace of uh, the very fast development that is going on with this city there are a lot of things going on and so my job is not just to talk about quote unquote bad things that are happening, but my job is to definitely dive in on not leaving problems where they are, right? But picking them apart to where we can start figuring out how to get to the root of problems. It is very, very difficult for us to get to the root of an issue if we don't sit down with the people who experience those problems and even sit down and even understand the mindset of people who create those problems. So it, that's even difficult to even sit down with. I can't imagine reading the narratives of a slaveholder and not having my blood pressure <laughs> boil, right? And immediately I wanted to throw it, through, throw it in the trash. I don't wanna deal with that part of the history, but I need to understand in the slaveholder's mind what made 
this um, atrocious act in history possible for them to participate in. So we understand when we see um, certain elements rising up in politics um, that we understand and be able to identify we've been here before. And if we don't understand what creates an avenue for individuals to rise to the top and participate in atrocious behaviors which can translate into impacts in everyday people's lives, then what we have is only half of a story. And so we have to understand both and we have to sit down and start unpacking these stories no matter how painful they are, no matter how hurting it is. Um, it is painful to, to read about history. It is absolutely painful to um, think about b before um, this city became this shining um, Southern Belle, the Dixie of Dynamo is what we're called, um, that we had human trafficking. Now, we have a term for that now. We say it's the Trail of Tears. That's human trafficking, right? Um, that we had uh, that great march and migration of people of which people did not survive. Um, and then we put those people, and how often do we even talk about right now Native Americans? The last thing that I saw about Native Americans during midterms was that um, in states of where they reside, because they have no street addresses, they couldn't vote. So even now we have those very real instances of oppression. If we don't talk about these things, then they will persist. And so my, my job is definitely just being able to take on the tough conversations that nobody ever wants to do. And it's, it's, it's rough. I get beat up all the time about it. But I'm intentional because I don't want to see problems persist. Um, history repeats if we don't learn our lesson. And so we are fortunate to be in the time that we're in because we have access to social media. We have books, we have a wonderful library which is expanding its resources. Uh, we have an opportunity to um, have events where we can actually, such as this, shout out to the Hunter Museum, where we can actually sit down and talk about this and nobody's going to get beat up about it, right? Um, and so we, we live in a time where we can really, I believe, start tackling some of the things that are going on and start unpacking issues and getting to the root cause and figuring out how we can not only put our minds into it, but how we can be intentional with ministry and put our hearts into solving problems. The Great Depression. So they had been through Jim Crow, they had been through several wars, they had been through uh, the oil crisis, <laughs> they had been through, um, one of them uh, actually saw the first African American president before she left here. They had been through these great and, and also difficult transitions in history. And so I would get stories from my grandmother on what it was like to um, be a domestic worker in, the, in houses of white people in New Jersey. I would get stories uh, from my grandmother on what Chattanooga would look like um, in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s on um, how many black businesses we used to have in the downtown area that we really don't have in existence anymore. Uh, so there was a lot of contextual history that I got every time I sat down with my grandparents. And I encourage each and every one of you, if you don't have people like that, find them. But if you do, I know sometimes grandma may ramble on, but <laughs> one day she's going to leave here and you're going to miss you're going to miss her. And, and those stories are, are sometimes it's those stories, those conversations that I have are the are the very few things that keep the fire going and, and, and help me keep on fighting this good fight because I know even though it was difficult for them um, to obtain silver rights, to obtain voting rights, even though I know it was difficult for them to um, to be able to get an education, even though I, I know it was difficult for them to walk in these city streets where I can walk freely and they had people who might spit on them and they have people who might call them the N-word and they may have people who would push them and shove them, um, may worry about, be worried about lynching them um, or beating them. Now I have an opportunity where 
if it happened, it's not going to be near as a level as what happened to them. And they saw change, but they worked on getting to that change. And so that's our job is that it's not going to be free. Right. We're going to have to claw our way for every piece of equity and justice that we want to see in this world. But it's quite possible. When my uh, grandchildren are having a problem, instead of me telling them what they ought to do, I tell them a story about mm. what I did when I had a similar situation. And they listen to that because it's not like criticizing them. It's just telling them a story about their grandmother and then they can follow that or not follow that. And also, I belong to a club that's a discussion group where we have people that have different uh, opinions about politics and religion and money and everything else, but we respect each other mm -hmm. and listen to each other. Um, but uh, whatever I, and we take a turn for five minutes to talk, but when I talk, it's not like I'm saying this is right and that's wrong and this is what I believe. I just tell them stories. and. Um, Everybody on every side listens to that. Oh, so stories are really important. And my focus for the coming year is stories. I don't, don't think that activism is like this, that you're alone. That this, that this trail that we're going on, you're alone. Lord knows I've prayed. I actually sat on my bed the other night and I cried. Hmm. Because I want this city to be so much better than how we found it. And we have to do that for our children. And I ask God, God, am I alone? Um, am I alone in wanting to see um, the city and just people treated, is it wrong to want everybody to be treated with decency and respect? Um, is that a difficult thing to want to see? Um, the fact that we talk about children of God has nothing to do with religion. You, you're born into this world, you're a child of God, and because you're breathing, you deserve decency and respect. And um, that should never be stripped of an individual. You are not alone. Even I was reminded, I got in the car today on an Uber, and he said, I saw one of your videos. You're doing an awesome job. Keep going. <laughs> and it meant everything because that lets me know that I'm not alone. And other activists, I tell them, you are not alone. And we are not alone. We are not without hope. Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, one of the most fascinating, beautiful letters in history. And he wrote it from a Birmingham jail. And he said, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever happens to one, it all affects each and every one of us. Tied in a single garment of destiny, we are in this thing together. If everybody gets their hands involved in changing this world and making it better, and nobody starves, nobody's hungry, nobody's on a tightrope, nobody's exhausted, nobody is slumped over, nobody is feeling like, am I going to make it? Nobody is submissive, we're all engaged, we're all taking up this thing and it makes it easier. Besides telling these stories to people you're comfortable with, you got to tell these stories to people who you're not comfortable with. Right. So they have to have a contextual understanding of where you come from, because a lot of times we talk about the problem, but we don't talk about how we filter that problem in a, in a real life experience. So how has um, how has racism impacted me? You know, I can say racism is a terrible thing, but if I explain that, you know, my heart skips a beat when a policeman pulls me over because I've had to watch so many people who look like me be brutalized um, and murdered um, and, and then nobody's ever have held accountable for that. And then and then breaking it down that this just doesn't happen to black people, but this happens to all 
kinds of people. This happens to transgender people. This happens to, to white people. This happens to Native American people. There is no way that we can, um, that you can somehow um, isolate yourself from the rest of the world. The beautiful thing about life is unless you're just um, beamed down from outer space and you have no family, no friends, nobody alike, nobody around you, the reality is, is that you are, again, in an inescapable network of mutuality. So while these things may not happen to particularly you, what you may discover is that these things have happened to people who are tied to you. And I think the other thing is that um, when we sit down with people, we don't focus on trying to change their mind. <laughs> um, everybody's not going to get on the freedom train. And I think that's okay. I think there are more than enough people who are going to get on the freedom train and keep the keep the steam going. And, and some people have to learn by just living life. And I think also it's getting out of your comfort zone and going to things like this. This is that this is absolutely amazing that we have the opportunity um, to have art, but also talk about issues and correlate it all together and then really start digging into some of the things that we that we see. So part of it also is getting out of your comfort zone. <laughs> like <laughs> if you if you don't go talk to the people in Lincoln Park, you, you won't understand how much history you have in the city and um, amazing people like Eric Atkins, who's a who's a, a historian. If you don't um, look at things like the Ed Johnson project, you wouldn't even think to stop to every time you drive over the Walnut Street Bridge that you honor Ed Johnson and Andy Blount and, and the men who were um, broken out of jail and then hung from that very bridge that people drive over every day and don't even think about a blood sacrifice that happened right here in our city. And so it's, um, th we when I say we're living in a beautiful time, we really are. I'm thankful for things like the Ed Johnson Project. They've taken that into the schools and actually started talking to children about uh, some of the historical context of what has happened here in the city of Chattanooga. So get out of your comfort zone, meet people who are not from your neighborhood, who've never gone to a church service with, this is one of the most church cities in America, <laughs> uh, who, who may not have gone to school with you, who may not look like you, who may not have the same language as you, but you have, if you sit down with them and, and, and you talk to them, I promise nine times out of 10, you'll walk away with a story that will open your eyes to a world that you've never been a visitor in.